according to my network adjusted uh, timing device here, it's 5.30. <laughs> so welcome. Welcome to this talk. So I am Tony Sager. Uh, thank, you for, thank you for being here. I'm really honored by your presence. So uh, my first DEF CON was in 2007. I know at this point in the day, right, your brains are full, your stomachs are empty, your thirst is like up here, you're getting tired. So I really appreciate that you'll spend the day, the end of your day here with me. And um, it's a little bit of a different kind of a talk. And when Jeff Moss said they had this war stories track, I couldn't resist because my whole life is about stories. You look at another guy, I, I've just passed uh, 47 years plus now in cybersecurity, except we didn't call it cybersecurity back then. So my purpose today, <laughs> yes, th th yes, I have survived. Oh, uh, so I'll have to tell you a story, right? Nobody survives for decades in cyber defense unless you're one of two personality types. Complete hopeless optimist or complete cynic. And both personality types have all the data they need to convince themselves they are right, right? If you want to see misery, if you're negative and you're thinking every day there's a disaster you can point to and say, see, I am right. If you're a hopeless optimist, guess what? I am. There's always reason to hope because there's great technology, great people, great opportunities to share. And that's why we're here today. So 2007, I was honored to be a keynote at both Black Hat in DEF CON. And that was a big step. I was employed by the National Security Agency, remember NSA, never say anything, that place. And I came out here and I'm sure I was by far the most senior technical manager ever to publicly be identified as one and speak at an event like this. But it was a bit of a coming out party. I, was, I came out here not with the standard government message, right? I'm with the government, I'm here to help you. I came out with a message, we are part of your community and we bring gifts, we bring presents, we bring content. So in 2001, I led the campaign to release NSA security guidance to the public through NSA.gov. That was a culture breaker at NSA. It took a lot of convincing to do that. But I was, I was trying to make a statement from inside NSA. We are part of the community and we are connected and we don't get better until we help each other get better. And I really believed in that. So that's why I came out here in 2007. So as I approached the twilight of my career, and if you didn't hear the early jokes, it was about uh, maybe this is the last time for me. Um, it's a chance for me to close the loop on my thinking, to come back to this place here, to reinforce that the role of that, uh, it's, it's more than a bumper sticker. We really do have to work together in a really complex situation. So let me just give you a little uh, short background. This is the one slide I used to illustrate uh, 47 years plus in cybersecurity. I started in the lower left, ComSec, anyone remember that? Communication security. I had no idea what I was doing. I had no idea what the career field was. I applied to NSA because I bumped into somebody who said, did you ever think about working at NSA? I said, what do they do? I don't know, but they hire mathematicians. I'm in, let me apply. I applied. I took the hardest math test of my life. I must have done okay. They brought me in for processing. I went through all the background stuff. Many of you know what that's like. I took a polygraph test the worst hour of my life. I did so well though, they invited me back again to try again. And then I didn't hear a word for six months and I get a call from a recruiter whose name I, I did not catch. Son, and back in the 70s, that's how older men talk to a punk kid like me. Son, if you can report in two weeks, you got a job. Great, what is this job? Can't tell you. <laughs> oh, okay, how about give me a hint? Well, we'd like to offer you a position in our ComSec communication security intern program. Great, what is that? Can't tell you. But if you go to the Encyclopedia Britannica, this is the actual conversation in mid 70s, go to the Encyclopedia Britannica and look up an article on cryptography. What? You had to spell it for me, crypto what? He said, yeah, and that'll give you an idea of what you're getting into. Hey, but this job offer is only good for two weeks till the end of the fiscal year. Just give me a yes or no. I said, I'll see you in two weeks. I don't have another job. So I showed up at NSA. I'm a ComSec guy working with some of the most amazing, brilliant mathematicians you'll ever bump into. Like you'll never bump into them because they're so weird. But, and what was the job? I came into NSA. When you think of NSA, you're thinking of spying, right? You're thinking of intelligence agency. Mm -mm. There's a little tiny sliver of it that works defense. If you're in a defensive 
role and you face an existential threat, right? Someone who means you harm to take you off this earth, to cause you great distress, but you don't know much about them. What do you do in order to manage that risk? You hire a bunch of wonks like me to sit in the back room and pretend to be the bad guy, right? Before there was red teams and penetration testing and zero day finders, that's how governments looked at this problem. And whether it was high consequence things like nuclear weapons or cryptography, that's how someone like me got a job. So I had a really odd career at NSA, 35 years in defense. All of it in a subset of that in vulnerability analysis, finding flaws in protocols, mathematics, systems, software, hardware, signals, chemistry, the kind of work that many of you do. Right? It draws amazing people, clever people, great technology. It is great fun. But I'm one of the few lifelong folks who've done this that can say, I lived inside an intelligence agency, the biggest attack engine maybe in the world. So that's what the talk is about today. A few lessons learned, right? A few observations. How did that shape the way that I think about defense? That's what I want to share with you today. I won't go through all this, the, the things, the jobs that I had. Those are actually all names of organizations that I worked in. So ComSec became information security, my life changed in 1981 because I switched from math to computer science. Some of you are probably my generation because NSA would buy me an Apple II Plus to have on my desk for work. Oh my God, that was the coolest technology ever. I was hooked forever. And so moving to computer science with a background in math let me ride the wave that we now call cyber through all those jobs. So here I'm gonna share a couple, of, just rapidly some lessons learned from my decades in this stuff. In cyber, this sounds like a bumper sticker, right? In cyberspace, we all have it more in common than different. But it's true. We are all deeply connected and we can't avoid it. And therefore we have to behave like it. But most of our security industry is about your enterprise defending yourself. That's a loser strategy. I'll talk more about how we need to think of this nationally. But we are deeply connected, including with the bad guys, whether we know it or not. So you have to think about this defense, not as how do I get everybody to defend themselves and add it all up and hope I have a secure economy. That will never happen. The bad guy doesn't do magic. I lived with professional bad guys for my entire first career at the National Security Agency. They are good at what they do, trust me. But they don't do magic. And if you treat them as magic, right? Oh my God, we can never defend against the nation state adversary. Oh my, you know, if you treat the attacker as a magician, you have only one defense, to hire your own magicians, to do your own magic. And that's a loser strategy, right? So I had bosses who looked around, who are the scruffiest looking people in the room? Nothing personal. They must be the smartest. Tony, an exact quote from one of my top level bosses, go hire me 50 of them hacker kids so we can figure this problem out. Uh, sir, be careful what you ask for. We're building a new professional science here. <laughs> and so scruffy doesn't always mean super smart or super productive, sir. <laughs> but a lot of folks didn't get that in those early days. But bad guys don't do magic. They have a budget. They have a boss. They have their own risk model. They don't like to get caught. They don't want to spend more money than they need to. And the more you understand about the bad guy, and the environment he operates in, the better you are able to design your own defenses. Knowing about flaws doesn't get them fixed. And this is a controversial one for some of you because many of you are in this business, right? This whole conference is about this, finding flaws, present at a conference, write a paper, give a demo. Here's my experience at the top levels of the US government for decades. Just pointing out flaws never gets them fixed. Never. You cannot scare people or inspire them with your cleverness into long-term action. The business of fixing problems, yes, it has a technical core, but it's about economics and incentives and psychology and public policy and regulatory environments and the threats of lawsuits. That's what defense becomes. That's what fixing problems requires. So when you create the incredible knowledge of flaws in software or in systems and you demonstrate them, 
you have to understand you can't just proudly trot it out at an event like this and walk away satisfied. That will never solve the problem at its root. You are part of an information machine I'll talk about in a second. And I know plenty of people of my generation who are still standing on the virtual street corners going, we solved that password problem in 1975 with the Binford 9000 A1 evaluated, blop, the blop, the blop, you know? You don't want to be that person in three decades, right? Ticked off at the industry because they weren't, didn't pay attention to your wisdom. You want to be part of the solution. We need the cleverness, the understanding of these problems but we need to figure out systemic ways to do something with them, not stand on the street corner yelling about get off my lawn and why didn't they listen to me in 1983. Defense is about choices. Defense is always about priority. And there's a thing in, in mathematics, uh, you've probably heard the, the term the Pareto principle or the 80-20 rule. Most of your impact comes from 20% of your choices and it's only mathematicians could dream up philosophy like that. But it turns out it's true in cybersecurity. That has driven my thinking for 20 years now. The question is not can you solve the entire problem at once, the question is how do we get started? What is the foundation of good defense? What are the next steps? What can I build upon? If you follow uh, my, my second career in the nonprofit land with the Center for Net Security, this is a bedrock philosophy of our nonprofit. Do not overwhelm people, help people. Get them started, get them the foundation help them with a, an on-ramp, a roadmap, how we're gonna get there. That's the important part, not the cleverness of stone tablets or you know, multi-thousand page um, control catalogs. And defense, again, we think of it as technology. Defense is an information management problem. And you need to understand that. Information about flaws has to get moved someplace. It has to be in a form that can be used by someone. It's always about moving information. That's what I came to conclude in the early 2000s. And, you know, in this industry we say, well, you know, if we just, if everyone would just share everything they know, we'll all be really smart and wise and it'll get better. That has never worked ever in my experience. Because the verb that matters is not share, the verb is translate. How do I translate millions of data points of badness that I see every day translate into a relatively small number of positive constructive steps that help me deal with the millions. You can't deal with millions. And the good news is you don't have to, right? Most attacks are actually repeats of a pattern. There aren't unique magical attacks happening every day. There's millions of repeats of the same garbage happening every day. And so you wanna pick those early steps in a way that gives you the most value and lets you build your defenses from a starting point, not try to solve it all in one meeting. And so the, the, the conclusion for me was cybersecurity is not an event, it's not a technology, it's not a training thing, it's all those, plus it's an information machine. A machine powered by the kind of analysis that folks like you do, the information that you understand about ways to break, but it's just a starting point. And so this machinery of who can translate where is the optimal place to solve a problem? I concluded long ago, it's not where you find it. We find it in the lab, we find it in real life. But it turns out, at least at any scale, problems are almost always best solved somewhere else. In policy, in acquisition, in configuration management, in identity management across your enterprise. That is the solution space that will stick. And so the key is can the understanding you gain from flaws has to be translated into information that helps people do those things better. Manage configurations, set up their systems, train their people, and so forth. So that takes more than, no one of us has all the knowledge to pull all that together. So a couple other things. So the National Security Agency, so how did this warp my thinking? So NSA, right? And some of you know the joke, NSA, the acronym means never say anything. Ha ha ha. It's also the name of my Classic rock cover band, by the way, if you ever want to come here. If you ever see a band never say anything, come see us. We'll hit you with the Rolling Stones and the Joe Giles band and so forth. But so NSA, you probably think of primarily as an intelligence agency, and that's fair, right? Spying on people. And some of you may find that distasteful. Some of you may have all kinds of things to say. Let me just tell you this. I spent 35 years there, proud to have served there. 
law-abiding, <laughs> rule-following, good people doing their best for their country, right? Dealing with a really dangerous world. Whatever you think of this whole business of counterintelligence, intelligence, and spying, you know it, at its core, the world is a dangerous place. It's not just for the US, it's for every friend, it's for every bystander, it's a dangerous place. And countries will do whatever it takes to get an advantage in that space. And that's the nature of what happens every day around the globe. Spying is a part of our lives, whether you like it, accept it, or care about it, it's part of the deal. But the other part of the mission, so they would traditionally say NSA has two missions, uh, signals intelligence and information assurance was kind of the, you know, the way I thought of it for most of my career. Now they really describe it as self, um, um, cybersecurity. So when you put offense in together, what do you get? Well, in the NSA case, if it was a pie, 90% of that pie is signals intelligence, right? It's the spying business, is the attack engine. And then there's a little old folks like me in defense, the 10%. 10% of the people, 10% of the resources, uh, right, attacking versus defense. That's historically how it worked out. It wasn't a conscious choice to say defense is less important. That's historically how it worked out. But this kind of structure, right, 90 to 10, also drives culture. And for those of you who don't care about management -y stuff, I used to have to. Culture is a fancy word for why do what do people believe? How do they make decisions? What do they think is right? What do they think is wrong? Those are very strong in many institutions, in many companies. In a place like NSA, which is a quasi-military, is a military support organization, culture is incredibly powerful. We spend a lot of time thinking about it, and it drives your behavior. But I, at some point in the early 2000s, and to give you an idea, sort of the different ways that culture can help you perceive the problem. I, I, I would uh, use in a speech like this, what I call the NSA offense defense culture test. Would you like to take it? Of course you would. And it goes something like this. In a world where we're all using basically the same technology, we're all on the same network, and we are connected to, way, in, to each other in ways that we do not understand until something bad happens, then I can only conclude one thing when I think about defense at the national level. No one gets better until everybody gets better, comma, here comes the test, wait for it. No one gets better until everybody gets better, comma, including the bad guys. So if you agree, including the bad guys, you've probably worked defense most of your life because you recognize we are deeply connected, right? We can't separate, there's no perimeter, there's no border, there's no, we are on there. We attack them, they attack us. It's just a constant flow. If you argue with me and try to talk me out of that last clause, including the bad guys, you probably spent your life working in offense because you like easy targets. A world of flawed technology, is your playground. You get to do what you want. And you would desperately like to separate the problem of offense from defense. I had some of the smartest people in my entire career say some of the dumbest things I've ever heard. Hey Tony, why don't we write, why don't we write our own patches for Microsoft software in the defense department? <sighs> uh, please, please. Are you kidding me? Why don't we write a friendly worm that runs through the entire internet and fixes our systems, but not theirs. Please, come on. All right, that's desperation. You're trying to separate the two problems. Impossible, it'll never happen. But in, also in cultures, you have subcultures like at NSA. So when I, I mentioned uh, we released to the public the NSA security guides in 2001, guess who the primary objectors were when I was, was carrying this campaign out? The people who work defense. What did they say? You ever heard this phrase in your organization if you work in a large organization? The other side of the house will never let us do it. That's people that are beaten down by culture. 
they believe their work, right, that little information trip is less important than the attack mission. I stopped meetings. I said, stop. Do not make their argument for them. Our mission is just as important. I'm not saying it's more important, but it's just as important. And you cannot just give up on this. And then I would say, you say the other side will object. Give me a name. Give me a name. And they would name some leading light of the attack engine. I already talked to them. They're good with this. See, I'm a pretty good bureaucrat too. I was ready. I was ready for these questions. But that's how strong culture is. But it's also recognition. What does the boss care about? Who gets rewarded? On the attack side, you get to say, these evil people who mean us harm are no longer on this earth thanks to our work. People talk like that, by the way. On defense, what do you say? Well, we really worked hard with this end. They're doing a better job of software uh, acquisition because we're helping them configure this stuff ahead of time. Guess who gets the recognition and the reward? Guess where the management pays attention? That's where cultures are strong. So it sounds like I, I hated working at the NSA, right, as a defender? Not at all. But at some point, I found it frustrating because of this mismatch. And I, was, I gave serious thought to maybe it's time for me to leave NSA in the middle of my career. Go to a DISA, go to a NIST, go to wherever. What I realized, I could do so much more to affect defense from within inside an offensive organization. And remember this, defense wins championships, right? Football season's coming, but offense wins budgets every time. Even fake offense red wins budgets. How many of you have been in a company where they brought in a red team and what you saw as a result was like, well, we knew that. All the IT people knew that. The ComSec people knew that. Security people knew that. We just, how often will we pay to rediscover what we already knew? But people love red teaming because it's mysterious and it's spooky and it's cool. And they work for me. I love them. They're great at what they do. But people will spend money to rediscover the obvious before they'll spend money to fix the obvious. Isn't that a crime? So Pac-Man eats up the little guys, right? But no. So offense plus defense. A couple of thoughts here. I'm, I'm sorry. I'll, I'll riff on this all day and I, I don't want to subject you to that. What I learned though, being part of that offensive engine, the amount of money that drives the offense, the spin-off into defense of cross-training people in both offense and defense, astounding. You could never get that kind of resources together in a, and I say this with respect to my, my many government friends at a NIST or a DISA or places like that, never. The access to the resources, the financial, the attention of um, uh, senior law, um, policymakers in the US government, the worldwide insight to watch a worldwide attack engine at full speed gives you that understanding. They're good at what they do, but what they do is complex and fragile. And if you pick the right steps, you can cause them great harm, pain, or fear of discovery. In fact, you learn things like one thing that attackers don't like is uncertainty. They have to spend money, they have to convince a boss, they have to take risks. So learning to manipulate their uncertainty is a key defensive strategy. You also learn that when nations attack, it's not just about packets and bad software and missing patches. They attack everything, as I hinted early, the signals in the air, the chemistry of your machines, your human beings, your physical locks. All that is fair game in nation state attacks. And that's the way that you have to think of it. And so we've used the term, like even in our work today at the Center for Internet Security, offense informs defense. You also have to think of defense informs offense. When you're part of the attack engine, you get to see how other people defend themselves. That often tells you what they know is vulnerable and therefore how they're going to attack you. So being able to pull all this insight into one place has been an incredible experience and really shaped my thinking about defense. So just a couple last things I'll, I'll say here and then I'll wrap up. So many of you are in the business, right, are really good at the business of finding flaws. But in NSA, we tried to have some rigor in the way we thought about it. We would, and we would, because people in this industry throw around attack, exploit, flaw, weakness, zero day, they throw this stuff around without definition. So it all sounds the same, especially to policymakers. This is the, the sort of scale I used back then. Weaknesses are something that makes the analyst feel a little oogie. You know, I know there's gotta be something there to attack. Is there a flaw there? They fail to authenticate this transaction. Does it indicate a vulnerability? 
a potentially exploitable condition. I cannot explain to you how much money we spent to go from vulnerability to actual attacks in things like red teaming. It's non-trivial. And so your understanding of risk is really different depending on how you think of that problem. And so exploits, so how do I put a series of steps together to take advantage of that vulnerability? Attack is about real life, the real life conditions of what the world looks like, which is what the attacker really has to deal with. And so again, variability, uncertainty, visibility, those are all things that they care about on their end. And I won't go through this here. Last thing I thought I'll leave you with here is, uh, oh, is this like the, uh, I've never been chased out of a room by a bird before. Uh, I promise there are no active electronics on that uh, bird. <laughs> um, but remember this, especially when you think of this at the national level, there's always two levels of attack happening all the time. The difference between the, and we tend to think of this industry as about technical attacks on each other, but the technical attacker, uh, the bird has just left, the uh, Elvis has left the building and the bird has left the room. Uh, remember that the attacker usually reports to a senior decision maker, a military leader, a political person, and so there are two levels of defense, right? Manipulating the attack to stop it technically or causing uncertainty in the eyes of the decision maker. So the decision maker comes to the technical wonk and says, you tell me that if hostility starts, your cyber attack will bring down the radars of that company so they won't be able to, uh, country, so they won't be able to see our planes coming in. You tell me that you're certain that's gonna work. Sir? We're really sure, we have tested in the lab several times. You've tested it in the lab several times and you want me to put my reputation, my, maybe my life, based upon you've tested it in the lab a couple of times? So that's a second way to manipulate defense by manipulating the attacker on the other end. All right, so, it, so the summary. I spent my life, again, I had the, the incredible opportunity to serve my country this uh, 35 years in cyber defense, or help, help shape, ride the wave, become a big part of what I think uh, the, the industry has become, do it in a really unique setting, and then recognize that that setting helped shape the way I think of this problem. And my invitation to you, the audience here, you are the information, the creators that can help drive the machine of solutions. But you're not gonna do it it's great to come out here, give the talk, show the demo, write the paper. You've got to find how do you become part of that machine, part of that solution. Whose information, whose hands does it need to be in to make a difference? And you can find your friends in government. You can find them in the uh, you know, responsible disclosure community. You can find them in nonprofit space. But the goal is you don't solve the problem by yourself. You build alliances that will help you drive this machine so that we're all living in a safer place. So let me just wrap up here. 2007, I was here for the first time. I didn't know if I was gonna be uh, greeted as an NSA person by villagers with torches and pitchforks or chased out. It, it turned out I need not worry. <laughs> Even at DEF CON, the people were so respectful and thankful that someone who worked this kind of a job from the government would come out to the talk to them. And so my, my career, you know, was shaped by that kind of experience, right? To bring us out to be a part of this community. Yes, there have been ups and downs and moments or times in history where it's awkward for industry to work with the U.S. government, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end of the day, there's so many great people in this industry, government, private sector, academics, independents, nonprofits. I just have to believe, I'm still that hopeless optimist that we can make a difference in this industry. So thank you for giving me a chance to come out here. Thank you for ending your day here. If you have questions or want to talk, I'll stick around for a few minutes. But thank you again very much. Thank you. Thank you.